Hey guys, big news. For the next several weeks, we have a brand new spirit science series about DMT and psychedelics, featuring none other than Dr. Rick Strassman, the father of modern psychedelic research. To kick off this new flow, we've done a podcast with him that we wanted to share. Also on September 7th, we're hosting a free workshop all about healing with plant medicine. You can RSVP to the event for free using the link in the description. And this workshop will kick off our brand new full length course, Spirit Medicine Walkers. It's not something you're gonna wanna miss. Okay, enjoy the talk. Yeah, Rick, it's such a pleasure and an honor to meet you and to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks. It's my pleasure. I think I speak for a lot of my audience when I say, you know, as far as the brand that I've created is called Spirit Science, but out of everybody on the planet who is a true spirit scientist, I don't know anyone better than you to, to really be first in line to receive that title. And your work truly is is quite remarkable. It's It's inspired so many. It almost seems as though that your work in a way was prophetic, this pioneering the psychedelic research. I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, it would depend on what you mean by prophetic. Uh, you're using it in the commonly accepted sense of the word in terms of foretelling or predicting. And in my prophetic states book, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, I uh, you know, broadened the definition to include any spiritual experience as laid down in the Hebrew Bible. But in terms of my work being foretelling, a more accurate uh, expression would be that it was ahead of its time. Uh, the, you know, the DMT work occurred in the early 90s and it took a long time for anybody to catch up. You know, it was also a no brainer in a way, kind of like the DMT work was. It was, you know, the obvious place to look in order to answer certain questions. It seemed like it. I found it so interesting that even in the first book in, in DMT, The Spirit Molecule, you described the story of talking with one of your colleagues and you just asked them, you're like, do you think that like, you know, the, the pineal gland has anything to do with spiritual or mystical states? And, and he responded with this, like, there is no connection between, you know, like just a very hard line here. That must have been really difficult for you to, to be dealing with. Like while you're doing this pioneering research, all these other academics are, are basically telling you, no, there's nothing there, right? Well, that comment about the pineal was, uh, you know, that occurred in 1980, 1983, I think. Um, and I was still in training. I was doing my fellowship at UC San Diego. Um, and I was just learning about, you know, psychopharmacology at the nuts and bolts level, uh, you know, really getting into it, brain chemistry, brain pharmacology, subjective experience, giving drugs, giving rating scales, drawing blood samples and the like. And I was you know, pretty excited. And it, uh, it seemed to me a stepping stone to doing the work that I really wanted to, which was looking at the biology of spiritual experience. You know, so I was kind of just, you know, brainstorming with this professor. Uh, I hadn't really begun. I hadn't even started applying for any of my permits. But I was just curious, you know, where at an institution where these things are happening, uh, can we, you know, discuss this? And he just said, forget it. Um, and it was a good lesson because I didn't have anything to lose because uh, I wasn't really engaged in anything at the time other than you know, thyroid hormone research. Uh, so it did you know, tell me I should keep my ideas to myself until I was in a position or even after you know, beginning uh, to do the actual research. Right. And, and it must have been quite a shock for you, unless I'm mistaken, when you started doing these DMT trials and people were telling you, like, I went to another dimension or I met, you know, these beings. And y you described the sort of the struggle within you of, of being like, I don't believe you. But that even caused conflict in the in the experiments. Right. I mean, w w did it was it like a seamless process for you to start to like look at like maybe maybe there is another dimension. Right. Because you were skeptical at first. Yeah, I mean, the stories were really unusual, and it was hard for me to accept them at face value. Uh, but that's what the volunteers reported back to me, face value. I mean, this is what they saw, this is what they felt, this is what they heard. You know, this is how they you know, felt about it. Yeah, I was interpreting all the trips through either one of three of, you know, theoretical, you know, lenses. Um, either the purely psychopharmacological one, this is your brain on drugs, 
or the you know, psychological one, which is, you know, these are just uh, you know, representations of psychological you know, processes, impulses or drives, conflicts. And the Buddhist perspective, which I you know, brought to bear on the study, they still you know, posited that the experiences were in a way delusional. They really weren't true. Uh, they were more things that the mind sprung up or unleashed uh, on the way towards the goal of the true enlightened state, which was you know, formless, no content, no thoughts, no feelings. So each of those three perspectives posited the unreality. I mean, even though I never you know, told people point blank, oh, you know, that can't be, I was skeptical and I you know, kept it to myself, but I must have expressed it in what I said or how I looked. Yeah, you know, so at a certain point, I just you know, did a you know, thought experiment and said to myself, what if these are real independent, freestanding, objective, alternative, uh, you know, layers of reality. Uh, if that was the case, you know, then what? Um, you know, let's explore what that's like rather than, you know, testing whether it's true or not. Once I came to that approach, uh, volunteers were uh, more comfortable sharing some of the stranger aspects of their experiences. You know, my skeptical, unconscious communications with them you know, probably inhibited some of their freedom in really describing you know, some of the uh, you know, properties or aspects of what they had just undergone. How do you feel about, like, more specifically, like, where people go when they take psychedelics? Like, wh what, what is your understanding at the moment? Well, I think the psychedelic experience takes place in one's individual mind. You know, so at one state of health, what you've read, what you haven't read, uh, what you've done with your life, you know, so all of those things determine your mind. Whether or not these are real alternative universes or purely the product of brain chemistry, um, I just don't, I don't think we can answer it. Uh, at first I was skeptical and then I was a believer. And, uh, you know, now I'm kind of at the point of saying, you know, we just don't know. Um, it's really hard to, you know, to test. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we need to make the most of our psychedelic experiences. Right. You described uh, many times uh, the if so, so what question. And I really like that. Like asking the question, like, okay, if if all of this is true and there are all these multiple dimensions and the pineal gland can give you glimpses into them, so what? what like, what does it mean? And I, I often wonder if that would have like paradigm shattering consequences if it were true, you know, for any... Uh, mainstream religion, ideology, spirituality, uh, and even our political systems and our social systems, how all of that would change if suddenly there was an open acknowledgement of the access to higher dimensions, right? The approach that you've taken here, it's, it's very grounded in a practicality. And I think that's, that's also very appreciated probably by a lot of, you know, mainstream academics today to be able to explore this and not jump to conclusions either way. Um, well, I think because the experiences are so dependent, or they're completely dependent on your mind, uh, your own personal psyche, I'm not sure if it's always the case you're accessing higher dimensions. You could be accessing lower dimensions. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's where the notion mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, uh, intellectual, moral, ethical scaffolding uh, is so important because it can uh, provide feedback for whether you're going off the rails or you're actually expanding the discussion. Very interesting. It seems as though it amplifies your consciousness wherever that's at. Does that sound resonant to you? Does that make sense to your experiences? Yeah, you know, Stan Groff a long time ago proposed that psychedelics are non-specific mental amplifiers of the unconscious. Uh, but I think it's even you know more expansive than that. They're non-specific amplifiers of, of consciousness, of both your conscious mind and your unconscious mind. You know, not specifically amplify or, you know, not exactly amplify, but um, make what's already in your mind that you are aware of more true or you're more convinced of its truth. You know, so you may think to yourself, well, I'd like to believe in God. You know, so you're thinking about it and, you know, and you know, then you trip and you experience, you know, something that seems to you like God. You now believe in God and, you know, then you take that newfound firm belief in your everyday life and then start exploring, you know, where it may lead to. It could be a conscious material, you know, like in the example of the Manson group, you know, all those things in their minds were already there, uh, but they just became more convinced of their truth and, uh, you know, the necessity to act them out. 
and in a positive way too. Um, if you want to you know, do something, let's say that you just can't quite get yourself to do, like go back to school um, and you trip and you're convinced of the, you know, the goodness, you know, the rightness, the inevitability uh, of going back to school. And, you know, then you work that out later. Wow. I love that, actually. I think what you just described, it mirrors this uh, this discovery by uh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences and uh, Dr. Dean Radden and his work, who recently came out with this, uh, well, it was a few years ago now, I remember, where he, they basically had come up with the evidence through experiments that it's intention that steers reality. And this is very familiar even to the ayahuasca experiences that I've had at the, you know, the various uh, shamanic locations that I've done that is that they'll often say that, look, it's not the, it's not the medicine. It's not the psychedelic. It's, it's that your intention is steering the potency of the plant medicine of the, of the psychedelic drug. And so what you just said seems to really line up with that very well of like, it's, it's really your intention and whatever you're trying to create, whether positive or negative or belief in God or disbelief in God, the, the, the psychedelic will help you in giving that a thumbs up, if that's, would you say that that's accurate? Well, it'll clarify your intention. You know, most people, if they are aware of it or not, are following through on their intention to be happy, to be rich, to be sexy, to, you know, travel, you know, that's their intention. Um, You want to clarify your intention before you trip. You really want to pare it down. On the psychedelic, you'll examine it from different perspectives, which weren't available previously. Uh, you know, so you may change your mind. You, you may decide you know, that intention is bogus and one that you were thinking maybe you might want to switch to become more spiritual, let's say, you know, now takes you know, center stage, you know, whereas before uh, it was to you know, travel or make a lot of money. That's a really good point, actually. Wow. Clarifying your main intention, but also maybe all the deeper subconscious things that are within you, that... That makes perfect sense. One of the things that I was also reflecting on in DMT and the Soul of Prophecy was, you know, speaking to the connection to the, you know, the ancient uh, prophets of of the Old Testament, and you know, these connections, these striking connections. You wrote a little bit about how, you know, there are some who theorize that the manna in the Bible was actually mushrooms, or was maybe a psychedelic, or that some, you know, the burning bush maybe was like the acacia tree and stuff like this with with a various DMT substances. And I'm wondering, like, you know, more specifically from you, like with your awareness and all of this research that you've done, do you think that these Old Testament writers had had some form of psychedelic? Or do you think that they were facilitating an endogenous experience? Or was it something completely different that that's not even psychedelic related? Well, you know, to the extent that the prophetic visions are similar to DMT visions, it makes you know, sense you know, that endogenous DMT may play a role. And uh, we learned just last year that the brain makes DMT in rather high quantities comparable to serotonin, dopamine, you know, so there seems to be a, D, a DMT neurotransmitter system in the mammalian brain whose function is just going to begin to be understood. But, you know, be that as it may, you know, in the Prophetic States book, I do a you know, side-by-side comparison uh, of the DMT experience and the you know, prophetic experience. And as I mentioned earlier, I define you know, prophecy as any spiritual experience. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, you know, the most you know, memorable are the you know, visions of, of you know, Moses, let's say, or Ezekiel or Jeremiah, um, you know, Daniel, especially. Um, you know, so I compared you know, the phenomenology, you know, the visions, the colors, the movement in the visions, you know, the feelings, the sounds, you know, the bodily sensations, the emotions, and, and there's quite striking overlap. You know, the evidence for the figures in the text taking in you know, substances from the outside is pretty meager. You know, there's the incense, but there's only one very uh, abstruse, you know, reference to the possibility of, you know, the incense, you know, helping reveal God's glory. And it only occurs one time in one person, uh, you know, one time a year, you know, for one person. Uh, you know, Moses is burning bush. You know, that was one guy one time, uh, you know, the manna. You know, you know, there wasn't any manna, you know, um, you know during the time of Ezekiel and Jeremiah uh, or Daniel. You know, there isn't, you know, much evidence in, you know, the text for, you know, taking in exogenous, you know, substances. And, you know, we already have got a you know, source of DMT, um, w- which is the brain. You know, whether or not 
DMT levels, you know, rose in the brains of the prophetic figures in the text, we'll never know, uh, is an interesting question. And I think it is irrelevant for contemporary spiritual experience. Yes. Yeah, I know. I would agree with that. And do you think there's a relationship, though, to, you know, when we go back and look at other ancient cultures around the time, especially the ancient Greeks uh, we know of with their mystery schools, uh, we know that they did do psychedelic practices of sorts. You know, we, we know about certain ancient Egyptian plants as well as the mysterious Kaikion, and then there's Soma in India, and, you know, these sort of mysterious, what seem to be very psychedelic brews. Would it make sense then that if, if it was happening in Greece and India and ancient Egypt, you know, it's all very kind of localized in that, in that area, even if it didn't make it into the text, that perhaps that there, there was this connection in the Old Testament as well? Or do you think that one's more an isolated experience where the actual deities were showing up and maybe that was triggering the, the, the DMT and the, the endogenous DMT for them to be able to see those beings? You know what I mean? Uh, right. Um, well, you know, there's a couple of arguments that would go against that proposal or, you know, you know that idea. You know, one is, as I you know, mentioned, uh, there's really no you know, textual evidence for the use of substances. And if we're, and right. if there were that crucial, right. it, it would be, it would be mentioned, you know, like the Greeks mentioned it, the Egyptians mentioned it, you know, the Hindus mentioned it. If it were important mm -hmm. you know, to the ancient Hebrews, I would guess it would have appeared in the text. You know, the other is, you know, the unique aspect of Judaism um, or, of, you know, the ancient Hebrew religion as articulated in the Hebrew Bible. You know, right. it's, it's one God. There's no intermediaries. There's just you and God or the prophet anyway. But um, using substances uh, in the Hebrew Bible as seen through that mindset would be idolatry. It would be paganism. It would be the Canaanite religion, uh, ecstatic intoxication uh, in order to <clears throat> approach, you know, the local gods, you know, to thank them or, um, you know, request things you know, from them. The you know, text of the Hebrew Bible is quite explicit. Only, you know, YHV, it's only the Lord. You know, that's the only thing you sacrifice to. You know, the only thing you revere, the only thing you love, and the only thing you uh, serve. You know, so I think it's, you know, both. It's, you know, the you know, psychology of, you know, the ancient Hebrews. And I just don't think uh, there's any evidence, you know, textual. Do you have, if you're, if you're open to sharing it, of course, what was perhaps one of the most uh, insightful or enlightening or transformative psychedelic experiences that you've ever had? Well, you know, the one experience that I specifically you know, talk about is the first time I smoked DMT, which was in 86 or 87, you know, Terrence McKenna sat for me. Um, and, you know, I actually, you know, fib a bit, you know, the epilogue of the DMT book uh, is my trip uh, that took place uh, under, you know, Terrence's, you know, watchful gaze. Um, I described the volunteer as a 36-year-old you know, psychologist or something. Uh, but that's, you know, my experience. Uh, and, okay. uh, yeah, it was pretty <laughs> uh, transformative. Um, you know, it started working re real quickly. I laid down. And uh, I beheld this raging waterfall of color, this, this you know, waterfall made of raging color. Uh, and out of the waterfall emerged these three or four beings that were about three or you know, four feet high. And they were you know, singing, you know, sing song. You know, you know, they were looking at me and in this you know, sing song kind of way said, now do you see, now do you see, now do you see over and over again. And uh, I was just slack job, like, you know, what is this? Yeah, and it you know, started to fade, and uh, you know, I opened my eyes, you know, felt my hands, looked around, and uh, you know, stopped the melatonin work about a month after that, and moved into actually trying to get the DMT study off the ground. You know, just speaking a little bit to your personal DMT experience with the beings that said, "Now do you see?" as well as you know, all of the other beings that you know you've recorded ex experiments about with other people and even the things in the Bible, that, that question of is it outside of you, is it inside of you, there's, there seems to be some consistency sometimes with seeing certain kinds of beings. I mean, based on your research, does it seem to be like the entire universe or the, the, the multiverse or, you know, just this whole reality field is just like so densely populated with life and 
maybe even a little bit of irony that we're always wondering, like, are we alone in the universe? And you take one psychedelic and you can meet so many different beings. Is that is that funny or interesting to you? Well, you know, the issue of you know, dreams is, is interesting. Uh, you know, the Sanoi in Malaysia, I think, a tribe, you know, they put more credence in the dream world than the world of waking consciousness. You know, there are indications, depending on how much attention you want to direct you know, toward them, you know, that, well, that there is a spiritual, you know, level you know, to reality, you know, things which are normally invisible, uh, which we can then access uh, in an altered state, either through dreams or through psychedelics or other technologies. The nature of that spiritual is still impossible to objectively, shall we say, determine. Is it completely generated by our mind? Or is it just you know, perceived by the mind, which is you know, the top-down approach? I think in the case of Hebrew Bible prophecy, it's you know, top-down um, because that's what it says. Uh, and if you believe the text, that's what the implication is. You know, but in the contemporary world, the contemporary spiritual experience, we really can't you know, say. There's no objective way of determining that. You know, I believe that it's both, you know, that our ability to perceive things which exist outside of us is dependent on our state of development. You know, so if you have a clear window, you can you know, see things out there relatively you know, clearly. If it's a blurry, dirty window, even though those things are out there, you're you know, projecting a lot onto it because you can't make it out that well. I think it's a, yeah. um, it's a balance. Sorry, you, you got me smiling so much here because you reminded me of it's one sentence in your book, in the, the new one. It was like asking the question of whether you'd be seeing a glass, like a window or a mirror. And if you'd be looking inside of yourself versus looking through it. And I love that you just added the detail in there in terms of the quality of the mirror slash glass of like how clearly you're seeing through or seeing yourself. And that's a really I think that's a really valuable thing for people. Maybe that's how you can define it is it, it, it either becomes a window or a mirror. Your consciousness will determine if it's a clear lens or a, a you know, very foggy or dirty kind of thing. That's that's amazing. Thank you. I think that in sort of starting to wrap this up, I would love to ask you one final question, which is, do you have uh, an absolutely favorite psychedelic experience? Not not the experience itself, but like the psychedelic, like your favorite psychedelic well, I'm just not that into psychedelics these days, but uh, I like ayahuasca. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I like ayahuasca. I was a yeah. member of a ayahuasca using church up in Santa Fe for a short while. I really enjoyed those experiences. You know, they were good, they were bad, they were hard, they were easy, but you know, they were quite you know, substantive. Um, yeah, I think ayahuasca has a lot of healing uh, potential because of the combination uh, of the two uh, plants. Yeah, that's been that's been my experience too. Um, earlier on, we were talking about intent as being as important um, as the actual substance. That church uh, in Santa Fe that uses ayahuasca is, is called the UDV, and you know they were you know fighting uh, you know legally to be able to use ayahuasca, and they you know, had all of their ayahuasca confiscated by the DEA. It was you know held in storage. You know, so for a number of years, they you know did their ayahuasca ceremonies without ayahuasca. They just drank water, tap water, but they still worked. They still you know did their work. Uh, you know, so it was you know the beliefs, uh, you know the actions, the way of life, and you know a group consciousness. But there was no ayahuasca. You know, so I think you know that's an interesting example of you know the role of intent in determining what happens to you. Wow. Well. Um... Rick, thank you again so much for coming on this podcast. This has been one of the most enlightening and engaging two hours. I've been really, really amazed, really grateful for everything that you bring to the table uh, in terms of, you know, both again, like the science and the spirit. You, 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 you have both in a very grounded, down to earth, very practical awareness. And I think this is something we need more than ever right now. So thank you so much. And uh, make sure if you haven't read Rick's books, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and DMT, The Soul of Prophecy, they are incredible. And do you, you, you have some more books too, right? You just said you finished one a year ago? Uh, yeah, um, I wrote an autobiographical novel a year ago. It's called Joseph Levy Escapes Death. And it's, it's a story uh, that's about my alter ego uh, who gets really sick uh, and takes a long time to recover. Um, 
Yeah, you know, so it's pretty dark, pretty mordant, but pretty funny. It's categorized under humor <laughs> on Amazon. You know, that was an interesting you know, process. Uh, I was really sick. I almost died. Uh, I really got bad care and I had to make the most of it. So I thought if I survive, I'm going to write this up, you know, you know more data, more grist for the mill. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I recuperated and um, I wrote it up and it was published last year. It was just turned into an audible book in May too. So, uh, you know, it is available. I have a couple of pages on Facebook, a personal and a you know, public page, you know, so if I'm appearing on a show or you know, finished a podcast, which is now up, uh, if I've written something, post things on both my Facebooks. And I have got my own website, rickstrassman.com. You can order books through the website. I will sign and inscribe them. Ooh, I would love a signed copy. I love your books. They're really, uh, they've really been impactful for me. Thank you again. And, uh, and yeah, please have a beautiful day. And thanks everyone for tuning in.